everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us on the tightrope where, as you know, we have engaged in rich dialogue and try every episode every week to keep our balance on ever tougher issues. I'm Trisha Rose and I'm here today with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Cornell West. And we have a big important announcement to make today, which is that we are no longer doing the tightrope. This is our final episode. And we wanna talk about the show with you and say our, our best wishes and reflections. Um, but before we get into that, I wanna ask Cornell how he's feeling in this moment, as I always do. Cornell, how are you feeling right now, my dear? My dear sister, it is always a moment of unadulterated joy to be in your presence and to be in dialogue with you. And that has been the case now for over 13 consecutive months, mm. that there is no objective measure that can keep track of the fun, the wisdom, the insight the laughter, sometimes the tears, sometimes the singing, sometimes the moaning and the groaning, all of those are priceless realities that we have shared over the time span of the tightrope. So that uh, on the one hand, I say with the whisper, it's a love thing and it's been a love thing. Mm -hmm. And then I say with my Greek sister, Sappho, Greek sister of thousands of years ago, <laughs> where she say all love is in some sense bittersweet. Mm. And this is a bittersweet moment to even contemplate, let alone have to announce that uh, um, we're bringing the tightrope to a close. But how are you feeling, my dear sister? Well, I'm hanging on, brother. You know, I'm hanging on every week. I yeah. do my best for that. And, you know, it is for sure a bittersweet moment. Um, you know, it's... Uh, hard to believe that you know this thing that we built is so it, it, it exists in the world i mean you know we're gonna talk about a, a lot of things related to this but we really built something and i feel like it, it exists in the world so I'm, I'm really proud of that um but you know it's super bittersweet you know who in their right mind wouldn't want to spend every week hearing you reflect on things i feel like i got a front row seat to the finals every week <laughs> best seat in the house i had the combination of floor seats and the sky box so i had food and wine and company and i could see the equivalent of lebron james of the mind like right up close um so i feel blessed and incredibly grateful for this experience um and you know i just want to very quickly tell uh, our audience that you know, we would have been happy to do this for some longer period of time, as much as time could permit, if it was more financially su sustainable. You know, there's a huge team of amazing people who work around the clock to make this happen. And unfortunately, the financial formula just really doesn't work out. Podcasts can be very precarious financially, and they're just hard to, to, to be profitable with. Um, and we have a lot to do and we, we're always available for conversation. I mean, you know, you, you, the internet, there's a ton of opportunities, TV, you know, uh, social media to hear, especially from Cornell. But, but this format just turned out to be not something we could financially sustain as much as we would love to. Well, we were always on the court together. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's on true. We the were. court together. <laughs> But the all right, ball I going think. back and forth. But I, I, I do want to uh, just publicly acknowledge the, the very able leadership of our dear brother, Jeremy, the unbelievable work that he put in. Of course, he works right alongside brother James, but the sister Allie, the sister Kiana, the brother Dustin, brother Christian, and sister Lindsay, I mean, all part of the team Mm -hmm. that um, that kept us going week in and week out. We've had over 80 episodes. Unbelievable. Maybe even more. Maybe even more. I mean, we, we were moving toward uh, 90 and 95. It's only 360 some days in the year. We were on for about a year. So that right, uh, right. the yeah. kind of uh, investment that we made of time and energy, I think, uh, is notable. There's yeah, no yeah. doubt about that. And, I mean, uh, 
we started, I mean, we did our first show, uh, which I don't think we aired fully. We, you know, pilot in June, we launched officially in July, but you know, right. we, we've been really nose to the grindstone. That's a lot of episodes, 80 episodes. Ooh, uh, and when, episodes. You think, when you think about the context of when the tightrope comes into being, you know, right. I think, I think, you know, the monetary uh, financial unfeasibility of it is not the most important thing. That's, that's really not it. What's most important is that we took a year filled with crisis, mean spiritedness, violence, terror, loss with COVID, with Trump, with uh, George Floyd, and so on and so forth. And of course, the loss of your incredible mother, you know, Mrs. West, this was a year of so much to deal with. And we worked our best to create a space where people felt like there was a meaningful conversation with inspiration, uh, as you always provide honesty, uh, you know, reflection, and just, you know, a space of a certain kind of peace in a very unpeaceful environment. And to me, I'm super proud of that. It wasn't perfect. This wasn't no, you know, highly slick produced thing. You know, we're in my study. I'm in the same place I was, you know, (laughs) from the beginning. Um, Wearing my blue scarf, which you will see if you watch some back episodes. I've done worn this scarf many a a time. That's a deep scarf now. I know I wore it this last episode just for you, Cornell, because I know you like this blue. I love that scarf absolutely yeah yeah go ahead but right right in the middle of all of these different catastrophes personal political economic ecological uh uh, and and so forth that to have some kind of opening of perception and a, a a deepening of purpose makes all the difference in the world. And then when you add passion to that, mm-hmm. it's not just perception that has to do with the brain, mind, and cerebral activity, but it's also a purpose that comes from heart, mind, soul, so that the variety of voices, and you and I come from a tradition of lift every voice. And to just think, you know, from... Sonny Rollins and Noam Chomsky and Jane Fonda and Sister AOC and Rhapsody and I mean, Lecrae. I mean, it was, it, you can't keep track oh, of yeah, no, it's- the high quality voices. And I think, you know, it raises for me a deep question about the culture and it raises a question about ourselves because we all take personal responsibility in terms of trying to make sure that we of forces for good and provide quality dialogue for people. And we do all we can to do that. And there's always gonna be blind spots. There's always gonna be certain faults and foibles. But given what we did have to offer, you see, I think we had one of the most magnificent uh, dialogical moments in the culture. I really do. We, 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 we've had some unbelievable moments of, of, of perception and passion and purpose and inspiration yeah. that, you know, the culture that we live in, you just wonder whether there really is a, a, a demand for something like that in the way in which we would like. Right, right. Well, I mean, is that fair? You think? Yeah, am I, I think it's fair. You know, I mean, I think, look, it's almost impossible to figure out if there is such a demand because there's so much coming at people that is about immediate gratification and you know the sugar salt grease diet of of ideas right where it's just the most intense experience rather than a more reflective uh, backdrop and um, so yeah I think there's no question that it does signal a possibility that certain kinds of conversations are harder to have in this moment even though our base of audience has been incredibly interested oh, we've had excited in high and quality loyal. community and listeners and followers right. and so forth no, right right so i mean the question is the size and and was that about being unable a lack of awareness was it the fact that we were sort of not only a socratic style of communication but also a longer more you know, um, natural conversation. It's not scripted and it's not edited to the point of 
you know, of sort of highlights only, because there's so much now in terms of media narrative that's really about highlights. The whole thing is a highlight, right? It's like it's like a whole conversation is only a highlight reel. But we 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 didn't really do that. Um, and I think I think that that you know, hey, I'm proud of what we did, but I think it made it harder for for people to find us in the way that people get found in mass media right. today. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. Because I think I mean, one of the ironies is that uh, I was talking to a sister who I grew up with, the great neighborhood of Glen Elder, which is mm. the uh, magnificent ghetto, the ghetto fabulous spot on the chocolate side of Sacramento alongside Oak Park and Del Paso Heights. Uh, and she's a magnificent sister. Her name is Judy Walker. She's one mm. of the uh, visionary leaders to emerge out of Sacramento. She's the first black woman to be president of the National Association of, uh, Re of Realtors. Uh, and she's grounded right there in Sacramento. She was talking about how magnificent your, your lecture was. I think you spoke to them mm -hmm. was about yeah. a month ago, maybe. Yeah, maybe two, yeah, about six weeks ago. About six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And she was saying there were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. Mm -hmm. And I could think of even, you know, times that I left you get hundreds of people, but the question became, how do you translate that group into a sustaining community that's broad enough and expansive right. enough that can sustain a show like the tightrope. See, that was one of the questions that we were forever wrestling with as a group. Right, right. No, I think that is the fundamental question. And, you know, at the same time, there are many, many moments, and I would love to invite you to, to, new, to name some of them, because I know you're going to have great examples of this, <laughs> where people do something in one moment, and it's not until many months, many years later, sometimes long after they've passed on from this earth, that we appreciate what they did, right? So right, it's very true. possible that this podcast could go into the dust bins of history as a failed exercise of two, uh, you know, uh, intellectuals and academics, um, or it could be that it will have a life much longer and more meaningful to someone else beyond the amazing audience that we have right now, who knows? Um, no, that's, that's but, true. but I do that's think just true. to your point about what we offered, there were so many moments, Cornell, when you um, asked people a question about who they were as humans in the world because of the environment and the people around them who've loved them. You, you didn't ask them, so what's your policy position? So what argument did you have on page 97, right? None of this. It really began almost every episode with a, a grounding of sort of, of, of who this person was as a, as a broad human being. AOC interview is, is a great example mm -hmm. of this, where mm -hmm. you brought out more in her um, public sense of, of, of connection to her father and her family and her traditions in Puerto Rico than anybody, any interview whatsoever that I've seen with her. And so I'm very proud of the, of the setting that was created, right? The environment that was created because there are many people who we spoke to who've been on other people's podcasts and TV shows and documentaries. And I don't think the depths of what we heard came through. Same thing with Jane Fonda. Right, right? Um, And you did, with, that, uh, you did that with Sister Jane Fonda and Brother Fauci. Right, Brother Fauci. That's right, Brother Dr. Fauci. Anthony Fauci. He, he must have had 400 interviews in the last year, three, right. four months. And he opened up about his Jesuit education. He opened up about being a high school student and wrestling with the God question and becoming a, a, a humanist and what have you in a very powerful and eloquent way. Right, uh, right. Very, and and, very and much you. So. And you asked Noam Chomsky about, you know, who influenced him, who gave him, you know, um, that sort of bedrock uh, foundation on which to stand. And his answer was a whole host of unknown people, um, not, you know, famous people, not uh, people who were uh, generations ahead and that he aspired to be like them, but all the everyday people, I think, as you might call it right that yeah, yeah, that uh, yeah. that that go into making us who we are right not just our parents but teachers and nannies and babysitters and cousins and uncles and ministers and uh just aunts and uncles and 
cousins who aren't really cousins. <laughs> right. That's right. That's uh, right. You know? No, no. But that was one of the few moments when they, we really could see Brother Noam not just smiling and grinning, but even laughing and going back to that rich Jewish tradition in Philadelphia, shaping and molding him mm -hmm. in the neighborhood, summer camps, and how he's tried to be true to the best best of those values that he learned in that Jewish context that has made him such a universalist, such an internationalist, and, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the greatest public intellectual of our time. Right. No, I know. I hadn't seen him feel so, you know, intimately reflective, I don't think ever. And, you know, many people, Absolutely. you know, he shares a lot and he, he's incredibly insightful in other settings. But there's something that I think uh, the world that got created in the tightrope and maybe the timing as well and the circumstances. Um, but it That's was also true. there's also a lot of fun. There was also oh, a lot of yeah. oh. there was a lot of oh, <laughs> there was a lot of joking genius. around. <laughs> did genius boots. He just took off. Oh my, that he was brother, you know, him and the one. Took, oh, the two of you, oh, the two Lord. of you had us all laughing. <laughs> oh Lord, 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 Lord. Yeah. Mm. And I must say though, the dialogues with just you and I on Prince and Purple Rain. Mm -hmm. The dialogues on the virtues. Mm -hmm. Love. Yeah. Oof, good God of mine. Mm -hmm. Integrity. Think, yeah, integrity. Did you see Brother Skip's? Skip Gates' note about that, though. Yeah, yeah. It set Brother Skip on fire. The, yeah, the, yeah. Your, no, your I, words about love, virtue, so. Mm, yeah, no, I I really appreciate, I appreciate that we've gotten such good feedback from people who we both respect and admire and work with. And, um, you know, I think there, I think in terms of, uh, uh, there are a number of, of people who really appreciate what this show has brought. And I think we should be happy and proud about that, even if it ends a little earlier than, you know, than some might want. Certainly wasn't my expectation, you know, to to uh, to have to, to shut it down at this point. But, you know, you you no, know, you got to take what you can take. But um, but I mean, I know we've been on the court together. I got to go back to my basketball metaphor. So hold on a second. Hold on a second. I mean, for sure, we were on the court together. But but Cornell, I mean, you know, I just want to say, you know, it's hard to imagine, given how much people hold you in high esteem. Of course, you got haters. You know, we all got haters. You have a few more than most of us. <laughs> but oh, yeah. that said, oh, yeah. that that notwithstanding. And, um, and some of them in very high places. Yes, yes. You yeah, you pick some very, some uh, very places. power. They, right. You didn't just have some haters who were out on the corner somewhere. <laughs> they, um, they, and they cover all, all colors. They do. They, they do. Colors. They do. Lord, Lord, um, yeah. But I just want to say for someone who is, you know, has such a uh, people estimate you highly i still think it's i my experience has been that you're actually still underestimated which is kind of hard to believe but you know your capacity to you know it's such a subtle way that you're able to get right at what's underneath whatever we're ostensibly talking about and have a whole infrastructure beneath it that it not only illuminates what we're talking about but gives you something incredibly strong to stand on you know, intellectually, socially, personally, you know, there were so many weeks when we were wondering, what should somebody do? How should we act? Right. And, you know, how should we respond? You know, what are we going to do in this moment? And I, I don't even want to begin to start summarizing all the moments. I mean, obviously, there's George Floyd, there's Ahmaud Aubrey, there's right. Breonna Taylor, there's you know, all Absolutely. the cray cray nonsense that Trump said Absolutely. on a regular basis. Regular basis. Uh, then there's COVID and every moment about the loss and people just dying and elders just disappearing overnight. Right. I mean, and every time we talked about that, you were able to bring us without lots of fanfare, but just a clarity and a, and a foundation to give us a way to be um, sort of vaguely sane and to, to know what the what the North Star is, right? Because you lose your way in, in yeah. moments like this. That That's really what happened. So for me, this has been an unbelievable experience. I mean, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I just want to thank you very much for that. No, I, I thank you. And I say right back at you, I would say exactly the same thing in terms of dialogues that we've had. Dialogue for spirit, heart, mind constituting community not just here on the screen but spilling over not just in the united states but all around 
the world. I think the important thing, you know, is to remind ourselves of such a bittersweet moment that I think of somebody like uh, Ben Webster, you know, played some of the most sweet melodies ever to come out of the saxophone. Mm. And he would always say to himself, well, you know, I, I want to know what Coleman Hawkins thinks. You know, I want to know what Lester Young thinks. I want to know what Johnny Hodges thinks. Coltrane, what, what do you think? Now, I'm not selling as many records as I like, but I, I want to know what you, you're thinking. I, I can see, you know, same is true with, 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 uh, with somebody like a, uh, uh, a Nancy Wilson. I mean, Nancy Wilson is in a, She's overshadowed by Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah mm -hmm. Vaughn, Billie Holiday, Donna Washington, Carmen McRae. But everybody knows Nancy got so much going for her. And so if her records are not selling as much as the Billboard 100 in pop music, she wants to know what the people who she ascribes having real insight and wisdom as to what she's actually doing and what her calling is. Mm -hmm. So Nancy gets a call from Sarah and say, my dear sister from Ohio, I heard you sing that Skip Scarborough song, Don't Ask My Neighbor. You didn't just tear it up. You touched my soul. I could hear Nancy say, well, that's worth 100,000 records. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe not in my bank account, but that's <laughs> worth, that's worth 100,000 records. Yeah. I got a call from Sarah or Ella. And that's what the standard is. And that, that does make a difference. Yes, that's really true. That does that make a true. difference. I mean, you want both, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, Nancy Wilson sold a lot, a lot of records with Cannonball Adderley and the others, but she never really got a due. Ben Weston never got his due. Hank Jones never got his due on the piano because right. he's, he's there with Oscar Peterson. He's there with the Alonis yeah. Monk. He's there with these other giants and he's right. a giant too, but- right. He never really gets his due. I mean, I know right, Stanley right. Crouch used to make that point about Hank Jones. Brother Stanley, probably the greatest jazz critic of, 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 of our day, uh, even though he's wrong on a lot of political issues, but that brother. He, he knew he, some jazz music. He now. knew some jazz Stanley music. Stanley Crouch, when yeah. When he talked about Hank Jones, he said, oh, Lord, take me back. Take me back, like Andrew Andre Crouch would say, take me back to Hank Jones. Mm. Ooh. He got something to say. When I think of the tightrope, that's in many ways the tradition from which we flowed. Mm -hmm. uh, this on yeah. the chocolate side of town, trying to hold on to quality, integrity, honesty, decency, laughter, wisdom, self-criticism, but strong, strong critique, sometimes indictment. You see, that's that's the that was a Trisha Rose, Cornell West, dialectical interplay with the words as well as the spirit. That's true. And That's in that true. sense, you know, we, we got a lot to celebrate. We got a whole lot to celebrate. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, we don't need to hang our heads for sure. Oh, no, 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 we ain't hanging our heads. There's no, no hanging no. of our heads. No way. No, no, no. No way. Yeah, we were very yeah. blessed. We tried and to bless others, but we were deeply blessed. That is true, we, really very much so. And, you know, um, there were moments like uh, our, our, in our conversation with Rakim, you know, probably oh, to my yeah. mind, the greatest MC to come out of hip hop. The um, greatest of know, all time. I, I know it's a battle for people, but he would be my number one if we were going to start ranking. And uh, he, you know, was so moved by how important you are and, and you, people who make the commitments that you've made to you know to black people right because really it's not it's profitable to to be in the business of talking about racism but it's not profitable to be in the business of really standing firm in defense of black people consistently those are two very different things and Rakim was very touched by he, what he knows is your commitment when it's not popular when it's not uh, in fa in fashion and uh, and that was that was an important moment around what you're saying about about the integrity of the show and that that legacy that I hope it participates in, which is the legacy you described and also the one that 
that you've created in your own in your own life for people. Many people came on the show. Rakim was very moving in his response, but many people came on so grateful for what you've done as a, as a person and what uh, what insights you've brought and your contributions. You know, they weren't they weren't just coming on because they thought, oh, I always want to meet Cornell West. They were like, you know, thank you so much for being who you are. So, um, you know, it's just been uh, it's just seeing that week yeah. after week. Uh, so much appreciation. I, I, I mean, I know I hope you know how much people love you. And I hope, you know, mm-hmm. you know, that even with all the negative things that happen and all the disrespect and the Jim Crow curriculum that, you, that you've been <laughs> asked to, uh, to, to, to teach uh, that that people you 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 cannot be denied. You will not be denied. That, that's that's the way I see it. Well, I think you, you, you're very supportive, loving, and so very, very kind, because I, uh, I would say the exact thing about you, not just with the tightrope show, but your scholarship, your work, your teaching, your shaping of the young folk. But you know, I also wonder, in a moment in which, with the collapse of Jim Crow as a system of uh, legal terrorism, Mm-hmm. that we got the new Jim Crow with the mass incarceration, especially for black poor and working class people with mm. the prison system. Mm-hmm. Then we got mass incorporation for the black middle classes. Mm. You see. That's a nice one there, Corn. You see what I mean? Yeah. So that you mm-hmm. got so that the shadow of the uh, uh, legalized yeah. terrorism mm-hmm. of the old Jim Crow, right. once we broke the back of that, Mm-hmm. And they began to assassinate so many of our freedom fighters and incarcerate so many of our freedom fighters. And then with the mass incarceration, and Elizabeth Hinton and the others have made this point, Sister Naomi at Princeton as well, that it comes out of both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party together, mm-hmm. that you actually got this new Jim Crow so that this unbelievably vicious and barbaric system of incarcerating black and poor and working people. This disproportionately affected everybody, but disproportionately black and brown. But then for the black middle classes, right. the incorporation, the absorption right. into the mainstream. Mm-hmm. And so you and I, we tried to hold on to our voices and lift our voices the way the Johnson yeah. brothers taught us in the Negro National Anthem mm-hmm. and say, well, there is some progress in the mass incorporation because we're getting asked as the unprecedented opportunities. Mm-hmm. But if our voices are no longer tied to those who are being incarcerated and those who are being thoroughly dehumanized in a variety of different ways, Right. On the economic front, with the grotesque wealth and equality, with the dilapidated housing, with the indecent uh, access to health care or no access to health care too right. often, uh, no access to high quality education, drugs and the guns flowing like I don't know what, the king right. and gang access to a grocery store with quality food, then what happens to those voices? Right. in the decadent moment in which we find ourselves right right this is a this is a real issue you know so much of the moment uh of uh incorporation in, including mm-hmm. in higher education yes, um, yes. right higher yes. education corporate america is that the the radical change that people want is to bring their full selves to work or to be uh, treated with good equal opportunities for upward mobility inside of a given place. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're going to be in the place, you, you know, you might as well climb the ladder, but you have to ask yourself some basic questions. This is why I think, you know, your, your, your integrity is so important because you stay right on this. There's no getting around it. If, if you're going to stand next to you, people got to know what they're about to hear, which is what are you trying to be incorporated into? What mm. are you asking to be elevated in relation to, exactly. right? Um, and exactly. is this going to be your success at the expense, your success at the expense of everybody else? And then, you know, basically use your new platform of incorporation and status to justify the system because you're all right. 
um, because you've finally gotten where you want to go. But this this is vulnerable to all of us, right? It's, it's, you know, the, we're all vulnerable, I meant to say, to, to that possibility, whether it's a racial incorporation, whether it's gendered incorporation, whether That's it's right. sexual orientation incorporation, religious minority incorporation, you know, it's, it's possible in any moment, in any group. But it's important for us to keep our eye on this because you know, there's so much cultural appreciation. You know, if I see one more TV ad talking about uh, some companies doing this for small businesses of color and this other one is doing something else, I'm like, wait, do y'all, what happened to capitalism? You, the story the story you're telling about yourself can't Absolutely. possibly be this whole story, you know? That's exactly right. And see, one of the ways in which one can become highly successful and become the darling of the white neoliberal establishments, because it's more than just one, is to talk about race until the cows come home and don't say a mumbling word about predatory capitalism right. or militarism or imperial right. tentacles around the world. Or, or liberalism, right? Oh, yes, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so, I mean, part of the the challenge is I was just blessed to write this um, 60th edition, uh, 60th anniversary edition of Franz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. It was, it was very kind of them to ask me. You wow. know? Oh, Lord. Yeah. So I, That's a heavy responsibility. I oh, I read that thing twice and said a prayer. And uh, I wrote that thing. And, and it's interesting because, you know, Fanon begins with uh, Matthew 20, 16, where he says, the first shall be last and the last shall be shall be first. And he says, decolonization is the putting into practice of that sentence. Now that's a secular agnostic or really atheistic Marxist right. laying out, you know, in a metaphoric way, the wretched of the earth. And the question mm -hmm. becomes, how do we ensure we never become indifferent to them? Right. And one of the points I make in this introduction is, is that there's been such a massive neglect and pervasive betrayal of poor and working people by their own elites, mm -hmm. be it national, racial, gender, what have you, you see? Mm -hmm. So that you look at the American elites and the massive betrayal of poor and working people. Black elites, and this word gets very, very, very delicate. You see, the, the black, upper middle class, the black elite turning their backs on a black poor and black working class plight and predicament. So that's it's an afterthought, it becomes something symbolic, it becomes something that's tertiary, but right. it never puts black poor and working people at the center of the wretched of the earth at the center of their, we see, at the, at the center of their visions. We see it in South Africa right now, right. you can see what's going on. You see it in Haiti right now. Mm -hmm. You see it in, 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 in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, you know, how do we engage in honest critiques, if not indictments of the worst of our bourgeoisies, the narcissism and careerism and opportunism right. that has become just thoroughly hegemonic among so many black upper middle class folk. That's so true. Now, not yeah. all of them, because we always no, we know no, some not decent all, black not bourgeois all. folk. We know some of decent course, ones. Of course. But the of dominant course. tendency is... Right. There, isn't a, there should be a, a symposium, a panel, a, a discussion, you know, among the elite, uh, 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 the black elite in this context, but not only the black elite, who are committed to say, look, this isn't right. the way it ought to be. I mean, where's yes, that yes, panel yes. discussion? Where's that media moment? I mean, that, that should be a possibility. Yes. I, I don't see it. I didn't get, I didn't hear anybody, you know, holding that event at any time. That's the, and that's uh, been one of the drum beats that we've talked about yeah. and on the tightrope. I mean, even the, uh, the magnificent renaissance around the one and only James Baldwin, you know, it's just nobody like him. His genius is beyond description. He's genius of, 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 of the country, son of Harlem. But part of that re renaissance around him is still a silence mm -hmm. on the critique of the black bourgeoisie. Right. Because Baldwin himself didn't stay there long, the way E. Franklin Fraser did, the way Carter G. Woodson did. So in that sense, you wonder, well, what is the nature of the recovery and the recuperation of these great figures? 
Oh, that's really when interesting. What's really confronting us, you know, is the Obama moment. What's confronting us is the shadow cast by the neoliberal Democratic Party. What's, what's confronting us is the Black Congressional Caucus. And it's yeah. ties to big pharmaceutical companies. It's ties to corporate elite. It's ties to Wall Street. Right. See, that's the challenge of the 21st right. century if right. we're concerned about precious Jamal and precious Letitia in the hood. Right. And, and also, you know, prosperity, Christianity oh, and that Lord, black yes. middle class leadership is also, Absolutely. I think, in, in a similar in a similar boat. I, I had thought so. of this Baldwin, you know, um, renaissance in this way. This is really uh, I'm going to have to really think about that. Um, and me and Brother Eddie, know, we, 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 we wrestle with me and Eddie God, we wrestle with this all the time because he's written this, you know, masterpiece on Baldwin. And, uh, and rightly so. And then, you know, with Brother Coates being trotted out as the next ball one by the one and only Tony Morrison. And, we, you know, Coates is in, in, in many ways, I think, a force for good in terms of what he has to say. But he's got a number of different uh, uh, blind spots. And those blind spots are thick, very thick. And it, it makes it difficult for him to hit predatory capitalism won't say a mumbling word about what's going on with the Israeli-Palestinian situation. And when he does, he leans much more in, the, in, in a direction that's not critical in the way in which it ought, it seems to me, the Palestinian cause. But you know, if he did that, he'd be in deep trouble with so many of his, his friends uh, who support him. But he's just one example. I, I, people say I always tend to target certain folk in a, in a, in a, in a, in a strident manner. And I just use him because he's so important. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's here. I think his voice is important. Mm -hmm. Where is he now? He's on his way to Howard. It's a sterling yeah. brown chair. Yeah. Oh, now, yeah. since when well, Since when you end up with journalists and wordsmith getting sterling brown chairs? You know, sterling brown was one of the greatest figures of the 20th century in terms of wrestling with the uh, with, with yeah. literature and so forth and so on. But yeah, I'm glad yeah. he's going. Yeah, I'm, you glad know, he's I mean, going. I'm glad the brother's going. Yeah, you know, yeah. We just gotta I mean, keep I mean it real. look, I mean in, in, in his defense and in the in the defense of that trajectory, you know, academics have lost the capacity to speak to everyday people in an effective right. manner. We have grown more and more um, almost intellectually bureaucratic and uh, arcane yes. and interior and isolated we're like we're like medical specialists you know like the one doctor who does who only does surgery on this finger and knows right. that's all they know and they know everything you know that that whole kind of balkanization of, of ideas has left a void and i think you know there's some amazing journalists that have filled it i would count him among them so uh, i don't have true. you know so i mean i'm not saying you know there aren't grounds for critique but i think that's an important piece yeah. of the puzzle that you know universities have to deal with right they have, have to come to, to terms with right right so no I mean, that's 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 that, that that's very important that's very um, important. but i think and, in general you know you've got celebrity journalists uh who can use their celebrity in a very very positive way i think sister nicole is like that right, we, right. she was on the show we had a magnificent yeah she dialogue fantastic. Yeah. Of, you know that so the question is not just being celebrity, but how do you use it in right. getting people to see more broadly? You see, it's one yeah. thing to keep track of white supremacy and all of its barbarity. Right. Right. It's another thing to connect it to the class dynamics, the predatory capitalist context, the imperial expansions around the world. So you don't end up somehow being obsessed with your critique of race, but can't say a mumbling word when it comes to class injustice or imperial injustice. And in that way, that's part of our conversation. And that's why right, right. Brother Coates' voice is both indispensable and I'd be the first to defend him in terms of his, his talent and so forth. But in the end, it's radically inadequate mm -hmm. because we all come out of a tradition that set these high standards. And none of us, none of us approximate them. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not coming at anybody thinking I, embody some yeah. kind of grand excellence not at all i know it. Mm -hmm. i fall short but at the same time the question becomes in which way you, you want right, to feel better right yeah yeah well you know that's true we 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 all fallen short in one way or another but you know I'm, I'm proud of both of them for going to support howard to be to really to take you know a position at a premier you know hbcu 
um, and attempt to re sort of rejuvenate and anchor, right, for next generation, um, an option to see yourself building a black institution. I, I think that's an important piece of this um, puzzle. I, and, I, um, I do. I, I would agree with know. that. I would agree. Um, I mean, at yeah. the same time, you're losing brother Michael Fontroy tied to Ron Walter. Ron Walter is one of the great figures. That's true. In the history of politics in America. And he's on his way now to George Mason leaving Howard because Howard, like any other university, uh, is, is itself tied to the big money and the donors and the benefactors right, and the right. fears That's of true. the unionization of the professors and trying to keep yeah, reputation yeah. and spectacle in place and also hoping that you can speak to the real needs of the students who ought to be at the center, be it Howard, yeah. Harvard, Brown, Alabama right. State, Morgan right. State, and so forth and so on. Uh, and then you just got downright envy and resentment. I mean, you know, human beings are human beings. You got That's envy true. and resentment at University of North Carolina. You got it at Howard. Too. You got it at you Harvard. Got it everywhere. You got yeah. it at Brown. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I'm sure. I'd be trying to stay out of it, but I'm sure it's going to no, happen. No, no, but you, 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 one of the grand exemplars of persons who are able to uh, keep the integrity at the center of the sister Tricia, but you are rare. Very, very rare. Brother Andre, too. Now, how both of y'all end up in the same household is a story that needs to be told in and of itself. He's Jeez. amazing. I'm so great. I'm Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre in the same household. Hey, <laughs> but at the level of integrity, honesty, decency, intellectual depth and scope and moral sensibility, the two of you all really take the cake. Well, thank you. It's it's a he's he's a, an amazing, amazing person. And he in very in very much ways that I was describing about you, you know, he doesn't lose sight of what the whole point is all that's the time right. you know oh, every so true. often i'll be i'll go somewhere and i'll in my mind and be like well what about this he's like no you just you down that road no you, the stories are <laughs> oh, right, my bad i don't know what i was doing over there so i'm like a, i'm like uh you know stray cat every once in a while i need to be brought back and so he's uh, he's been keeping both of us on the straight yeah. narrow path for a long time yes he has yes but he, he has we got that from his mama and his daddy right oh, there in ohio and Oberlin, ohio Yep. Coming out and, of that and, rich black church tradition, the oh, best yes. of that black church tradition. We know it's got the worst is always there. Mm, no, that, that's for sure. That is true. And he's one of the best listeners in the game and a good listener. That is, is true. The most important thing, something I'm still struggling to work on better. Um, but, you know, I want to I want to uh, close this episode with your reflection on Sonny Rollins, because you know, this was another legendary audio uh, episode. You know, we didn't have video. There were some technical difficulties. And, you know, Brother Rollins is 90 plus, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was his 90th birthday. That's right. That's when right. We spoke to him. And, you know, he was amazing. So let me just say to you, tightrope people, if you did not listen to Sonny Rollins or didn't catch that episode because you were trying to keep up with the 82 episodes we was hitting it hitting it you like an ak-47 with episodes <laughs> you know ba -ba -da 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 -da. Uh, go back to Sonny rollins because he was amazing anyway he talked about um uh what where he is now and what he's trying to do and he he spoke about personal understanding and growth in the in in larger context i think was the phrase and so can you talk a little about that because you know, we talk a lot about values and how to face the public world, but what Sonny Rollins really emphasized was we have to understand ourselves. And that means loving ourselves, caring ourselves as the core activity. This is also a major piece of, you know, why my husband Andre is so amazing because he understands everything really starts there, right? He doesn't, it's like this outside world. You can't really address it until you've done your interior work. But Sonny yes. captured it. So you you would love this phrase. Can you share with, with me and everybody else what you think uh, that phrase was about and why it was important to you? Yeah, I must admit that uh, we've had so many wonderful and marvelous persons and figures that come our way. But for me, the one interview that stands out more than any other was to have a chance to speak to the artistic 
Colossus, Sonny Rollins. I was on cloud nine when I got up that morning in anticipation of the dialogue. And with the dialogue with the three of us, I was so high. Brother Marvin Gaye talking about flying high in the friendly sky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was so far beyond my brothers and sisters on heroin and crack and speed and other things just in dialogue with Sonny Rollins. Mm. Because what he was saying over and over again, you might recall, is he was linking his vocation and his sense of calling. And he said when he first heard Body and Soul by Coleman Hawkins, he changed his whole life. Then he becomes so close to Coltrane. He talked about Coltrane going to his house there, right? Looking up, right near the, the East River in Manhattan. And they spent an hours and mm -hmm. hours together just talking, playing, eating, reflecting. Mm -hmm. And they were always trying to get a sense of how their particular work was connected to what Sonny Rollins called the big picture. And you see, we kept saying over and over again, Coltrane and myself, we're trying to always stay in contact with the big picture. And the big picture, on the one hand, is a countervailing force against the hounds of hell, against the greed inside of our souls, against the hatred inside of our souls, the fear inside of our souls, the hypocrisy in our behavior. How do you push it back? Because it's always there. So that big picture is trying to lure us to something bigger. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Heschel used to say, something grander than us is luring us and calling us to do something for something bigger than us. And that bigger than us is a cause of everyday people. Mm -hmm. And the way Rollins used that language, and you remember he ended up talking about the golden rule. Mm -hmm. He ended up talking about I, the golden yeah. rule. You know, it yeah. was as if, you know, he was enacting uh, Lauren, the great character of Octavia Butler's grand parable of the sword, sword. 1993, with that syndrome of hyper empathy, hypersensitivity, genuine compassion and love of those catching hell in catastrophic circumstances. Now, Octavia Butler, that genius from the Northwest Pasadena, she was talking about the wretched of the earth is phenomenal. That's what's happening in that novel on the way to Sacramento, Clear Lake with the earth sea community. And what Sonny Rollins was talking about was, hey, me and Train, we were trying to plant some seeds here too. Because we had actually seen seeds sprout from Charlie Parker. We'd seen it sprout from Mary Lou Williams. We'd seen it sprout from Monk. We'd seen it sprout from Sarah Vaughn. And we want to be in on that earth seed activity. Mm -hmm. And both of us wrestling with our addictions, wrestling with our fears and insecurities and relationships, but always keeping our eyes on something bigger than us, the big picture. And here he was 90 years old. And he's telling us over and over again, yes, cultivate, cultivate yourself and soul, but also agitate agitate to cut against all forms of mediocrity, cut against all forms of mendacity, cut against all forms of cowardliness, no matter what form it takes, no matter who or what, what color the persons are who enact it. That's mm. Sonny Rollins. Mm. That's, and he does it in such a humble way. Yep, it, it was amazing. That when was it, it was something. I just, I'm, I'm glad that uh, we got that in the historical archives. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. I mean, just, this right. This whew. the market culture is not running down to track down Sonny Rollins as much as they should be, you know. Yes, so yes. this is there's a lot of people who uh, who have so much insight and have figured so much out and who understand what has happened, where we've come from, and you know, know where we should be going and not going. And uh, unfortunately, yeah, we don't invite them enough to the table to hear what's going on. But uh, that was a, that was a high mark. It, it was a high, was mark. A high mark. But we heard the same thing in Rhapsody. Younger we did. generation. We did. All and distinctive Tracy form Ellis Ross English. talk a lot about personal Ooh, the interior understanding. Tracy. She's really very committed to that as part of her own Marvelous. practice. Marvelous. Yeah. It's so we. I know there's so many others that we are forgetting that were also high moments, but yes, uh, 
Well, we, uh, we, we need a whole episode to, to talk about 82 episodes, so we can't even begin. <laughs> we need a special episode just to <laughs> count the names, let that's alone talk true. about them all. Oh, so that's so true. That we don't we don't we don't want to torture people with that. But um, but this that's was just a so real very, blessing. Very you know. true. Lord, it's Lord, true. I just want to thank you for bringing this joy in my life every week over 80, 80 90 times in the last year. It's uh. It's, it's something that I'll take to the grave with me. But the beautiful thing is, I'll see you and Brother Andre a zillion more times before the grave gobbles any of us. Oh, yes, indeed. We're, we're going to celebrate we, in person yes. as, soon, as soon as possible. The pandemic's about to, um, you know, pandemic's about to be hopefully enough we thing hope. in the past that we can celebrate together in person and have a tightrope, you know, an in-person reunion of the tightrope. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but, Absolutely. Uh, well, I, you know, just filled with gratitude. Thank you, Cornell. And thank you everybody who's been part of the tightrope for us, with us on Twitter, on Patreon, on YouTube, on Instagram, on all the places that the amazing people who produce this show uh made sure we were found um because certainly i wasn't responsible for that <laughs> cornell and i were definitely not responsible for that work um so your love and energy coming back to us i i matters to everyone on the team but especially to to myself and to cornell too so thank you everyone it's been a blessing and a joy and we will see you the next time on new places new things there's new opportunities in the world. Uh, and, and, you know, we hope you'll stay in touch with us as much as you can. Thank you so much for being with us. We are witnessing America as a failed social experiment. How do we tell this story in a way that builds the kind of emotional momentum that colorblind ideology builds? So many young brothers and sisters of the younger generation find themselves so far removed from the best of their past. What are we going to make out of the nothing we've been given? How do you envision possibilities?